times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Well, welcome back to all of our participants today. Welcome, Father Sebastian. Good to be here with you. We're now on the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. We keep focusing in this time period. Pentecost kind of like acts like this uh, shining like a, like a flashlight, a uh, spotlight for us. And it, um, it gives light to all of these Sundays following. As we've, we've been going through, we've covered the calling of the apostles on the Sea of Galilee, the initial instruction to the disciples, healing of the centurion servant, the healing of the demoniacs, the healing of the paralytic. Now today, the healing of the two blind men. So there's, we have this whole minute, early ministry of Christ in the Sea of Galilee that we've been really focusing upon since Pentecost, reminding us of the original purpose of Christ's ministry, Christ's mission. And then by extension, as we've been saying, we'll be looking at it again today, by learning about Christ's ministry, we're kind of in, as you called it last week, this boot camp of discipleship. Here's how the ministry of Christ goes, what it looks like, how it's done. And then now, in, as we move to the epistle, we look to that next generation of the early Christians, which becomes this model for us. So let's jump right in to Matthew chapter 9 this week. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 through 35. And there's a lot of themes in here that we want to pick up on and clarify Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 through 35. You got out your Bible here. We're going to get out the old trusty Bibles. No cell phones now. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. At that time, as Jesus was passing on, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Have pity on us, son of David. And when he had reached the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can do this for you? They answered him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, Let it be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were open, and Jesus strictly charged them, saying, See that no one knows of this. But they went out and spread his fame abroad throughout all that district. Now as they were going out, behold, there was brought to him a dumb man possessed by a devil. And when the devil had been cast out, the dumb man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Never has the like of this been seen in Israel? But the Pharisees said, By the prince of devils he casts out devils. And Jesus was going about all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and curing every kind of disease and infirmity in the people. The first thing we want to do here, Father Sebastian, we always want to cover the who, what, why, where, when. So we want to make sure we're in the proper context. We've been hearing about over the last few months, uh, well, yeah, months, as we've been after this time after Pentecost, looking at this healing ministry of Christ. But here in the Gospel of Matthew, exactly, where do we stand? What's the proper context? Where is Jesus at? It's so important because we talk about this political theme that's been going on, Jesus' movements and so forth from a geography standpoint. So in the Gospel of Matthew, where do we stand? Well, we're in the middle of the Galilean ministry, and this is where Jesus will spend most of his time. As we're reading in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're going to see him working in this area that's often called that evangelical triangle, this northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, primarily in this village, Capernaum. Right? And in chapter 9, we've been seeing these healings. He raises the paralytic. That's actually in Peter's house right there. You and I have been right there a number of times. And, and then he goes and he does these other great works, these other miracles in that right there in that town, heals the woman with the hemorrhage that's just up on the hill. You and I have been to that spot just uh, up the hill from the, the village there. And then he raises the girl from the dead. He heals these blind men and now this demoniac. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is preparing his disciples. He's had the disciples with him. We, we looked at that call the disciples back in chapter four, and now he's preparing his disciples through all of these things for what he is going to eventually call them to do, which comes in chapter 10. Beyond our reading here, he's going to call those disciples. So Jesus walks into, it seems like this is Capernaum he's in, and it probably Peter's house, if I'm not mistaken, if we're talking about the house. It was, it was Jesus, this is Jesus' home that Peter had opened to him. So he's walking into the village probably after doing some of the 
you know, ministry up there on the Mount of Beatitudes area and all that along the sea, he comes back into the village, and these two blind men cry out to him, have mercy on us, son of David. This is one of those lines that it just becomes almost like a throwaway line. You know, everybody, we just keep reading. Yeah, I'm son of David. But we, we need to spend a little bit of time here unpacking this. So what exactly did the blind men mean by calling him son of David? And I want to just, just stop. It's so easy if we just get in the habit of it to simply, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. Ask yourself the question, well, who's the son of David? But we move on in our reading so oftentimes our scripture reading and our prayer that we never stop to ask the question. Obviously, the son of David is Solomon. That begins to kind of almost like unlock the door for us, doesn't it? To open up a bigger picture to start to ask more questions. So, Father, what would these blind men have meant by this phrase, son of David? Obviously, they don't believe that, well, I don't think they believe that Solomon has been reincarnated or something like that. This, this got a bigger meaning by the time that the, the Messiah comes, by the time that Jesus comes. So talk to us about this, the Old Testament meaning, also the expectation of the Messiah coming. So when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, they were governed in what's usually called a theocracy. God was their king. Their, he was the king, and they were the kingdom of God, which, we're gonna, which we saw at the end of the gospel here, the kingdom of God. They were his kingdom. And Moses was this prophet and then we see Joshua and the judges as the kind of go-between between God and the people. But then toward the end of the time of the judges, as we see in the books of uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, the people ask for a human king. They want a human king. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And the problem is, as Samuel is frustrated as we read in the story there, that they already have a king. God is their king. But they want to have a king like the nations because the king goes out there and fights their battles for them on the front line. When Israel goes out to battle, they've got the ark there maybe. They've got some Levitical priests on the front line maybe. But they don't have a, a king that they can see in a chariot who's the mighty warrior leading the battle. And they're getting beaten up in their battles over and over. They're losing battles because they do not follow the ways of the Lord. So they ask for a human king, and God gives them a human king. The first one is Saul. They, they they wanted a king like the nations, so he gave them a king like the nations. That was Saul, a mighty warrior, but also a, a, a tyrant and a very difficult individual. But then, but then the Lord gives them a king after his own heart, not after the people's heart, and that is David. And since David is one who follows the Lord in all of his ways, God then gives a, makes a promise to David that he and his sons would would be a dynasty through which God would rule the kingdom through a human king. And so now Israel has these two kings. You have the divine king and the human king. And in David, at least, at least most of the time when he's behaving, the, the divine will and the human will are aligned. Now we know the rest of the story. It doesn't work out so well after that, even in David's own life. We know the story of Bathsheba and things like that. But God had made a promise to David in 2 Samuel 7. Because God want, because David wanted to build a, a house for the Lord so that the Lord could dwell among his people. God made a promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that only his line would be the legitimate human kings to sit on the throne to rule over Israel. Of course, we know that the kingdom was destroyed during the Babylonians. And then as we read in the last couple of books of the Old Testament, the kingdom is being restored in a certain sense, but not quite yet. What they need is they need the restoration of the most important aspects of that kingdom that they once had, and that is the return of the divine king to the dwelling place of God on earth, that is the temple, and they need the return of the human king to Jerusalem. So they're waiting for the return of two kings, the divine king and the human king, and that human king's title was not only the Christ, the anointed one, but also one of the other titles he had was because of that promise to David was son of David. And so when they cry out to Jesus as he's walking by, son of David, son of David, they're identifying him as the long awaited Messiah. And therefore they know, they believe he is the beginning, as many of the people in the region did at the time, that he is the beginning of the restoration of that kingdom of God. You know, you just gave us basically salvation history in about 30 seconds in the, in the sense that we went from 
from Saul, the calling of Saul, the anointing of David, the promise of 2 Samuel 7. So I, I want to just stop for a minute and encourage our participants today. This is why it's so important to have your Bible. You can uh, listen to us talk and you're not going to remember anything that we have to say. But if we can get in the habit of going back and, be, and becoming really Bible students, right, we're biblically literate, we're going to be well on our way to being able to understand what's going on in the New Testament. So I just want to encourage you very quickly, um, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, you're going to see that request of the, the people calling for a king, but unfortunately, like you said, like all the other nations. And then you can continue reading in chapter 9, the anointing of Saul and following. And then, of course, 1 Samuel chapter, at the end of chapter 15, the rejection of Saul as king, and chapter 16, that calling of David. But most importantly, Father, you mentioned 2 Samuel 7. If you could just turn us there, and let's just do a very quick taking a look at this text to make sure that we are all on the same page. Because 2 Samuel 7, as far as I understand it, is, is this like critical turning point, right? As far as this expect, setting the expectation for the Messiah, they would have held on to this chapter and the promises here in the forefront of their minds as they're looking around at the time of the coming of the Messiah, that they would have gone back to this text. I always, I always say Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7 as kind of the what happened chapter, because it's this great promise that the people put their hope on. But yet, as you said, it almost as though 2 Samuel chapter 7 isn't fulfilled. After the Babylonian, at the time of the Babylonian exile, it's, it's as though God has broken his promise here in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So can you just, just point out the key text for us here in the chapter? All right. So the, so the context of 2 Samuel chapter 7 is chapters 5 and 6 and things like that, right? As you mentioned, Saul didn't work out too well. And this was to be expected. He, God gave him, he said, look, here's a king after your own heart, right? Here's the king that you've chosen. And so it didn't work out. And so now the Lord chooses David to be the king over the, over the kingdom of God, the human king and to image his divine authority and his royal authority over the people. And so then in the end of the previous book, 1 Samuel, we hear about the death of Saul. And now in 2 Samuel, David is the sole human king. So David, be, David rules over Judah, then he rules over all of Israel, and they publicly anoint him as their king. And then now David in chapter 5 goes into Jerusalem, and he makes that his capital. And once he's made that his capital city for his, his big kingdom now, he then wants to build a house for the Lord so that the center of his kingdom is not simply political, but first and foremost, religious. It's the, it's the center to where God dwells among his people. And so he decides after having brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in chapter six, in chapter seven, he says, I want to build a house for the Lord. So the glory call will be here, not just a little, a little tent like Moses built, but a permanent resting place out of stone for the Lord to dwell among his people so that the divine king can rule here and direct the human king how to direct the people. And of course, God says to him, that's a wonderful idea, David, but you're not going to do it. Your son is going to do it. Your son that I will put on the throne after you will rule. And that text that you were talking about this comes in verse 12 he says when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers this is chapter 7 verse 12 i will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and i will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever i will be his father and he shall be my son and so this is also where we get that title for the king in the old testament the king was not only called the Christ, the anointed one, the one who had the spirit of God, but the king was also called son of David because of this text, but also, as we just saw, also called son of God. And in the New Testament, we're, it's, it's very important to understand that when we hear Jesus sometimes being referred to as son of David, sometimes he'd be referred to as son of God. We don't understand that Old Testament context and the, the kingdom imagery that's going on there. And so often we miss then really what's going on in that New Testament passage. You know, let's, let's jump back now with that background. And I, it was one other aspect actually that you were pointing out was this point about this idea of the divine king 
and the human king. And we see that develop in the prophets where after the Babylonian exile, there becomes this realization that, hey, this human king thing is not working out so well for us. And they begin to place their hope on, somehow we see this in like in Zechariah, for example, I think it's chapter 13 of Zechariah, where this idea that, that somehow the Lord himself, God is going to become their king again. We get this almost like this, this convergence of these two ideas now coming into the New Testament. Not that I, I don't think it's all that clear how this is actually going to work out, how it's going to take place. Of course, the Lord knows how it's going to take place in the incarnation. But, but now Jesus begins to fulfill this expectation of the people as he comes into his healing ministry. I love this question of Jesus. That he says, do you believe I can do this for you? And he, he's constantly doing this in his ministry where he asks a question that is almost, he does this to the paralytic in Jerusalem, where he says, do you want to be healed? <laughs> so it's almost like, really? He's been laying there for years, you know? And, uh, and, the, and the fathers of the church tell us that the Lord does this in order to kind of draw out this desire and to kind of begin to establish a relationship by asking the question and getting the response, this relationship begins to be developed. In this text, as with the other text of the blind men and the healing of the blind men in the Gospels, because Jesus doesn't just help heal these two guys, there's this important aspect that we need to remember. And that is that Jesus is going around doing all these miracles, and the only ones that don't see what he's doing are the blind ones, okay? Whereas all those that can see end up struggling to come to full faith in Christ. Here again, it's this power of faith. And I was just thinking about this text in Hebrews chapter 11. St. Paul says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The ones who could not see any of Jesus' miracles begin to trust him in his word, in what he says. And because of that deep communion that begins to be formed based upon what Jesus is saying to them, then the healing begins to take place. I, I found this really a, this beautiful quotation from one of the church fathers. He says, the blind men saw because they believed. They did not believe because they saw. From this, we understand that what is requested must be predicated on faith and that faith must not be exercised because of what has been obtained. If they should believe, he offers them sight and he charges the believers to be silent. So, you know, I was speaking with somebody recently that said that it was, you know, wanted uh, uh, the healing of a loved one. They said, I would do anything for Jesus if he would do this. It's almost like they get in this poker game or this gambling game with Jesus. Like, I challenge you, if you'll heal, then I'll, then I'll follow. But here the gospel presents a whole other picture of those who are unable to see, and yet they give themselves totally to Christ. And it is because they give themselves totally to Christ that the restoration of the image and likeness of God begins to uh, take place in them first, in the forgiveness of sins, as we saw with the paralytic, and then only by extension for the sake of others in the restoration of their body. With that, let's get right back to the gospel here. It says, and after he healed them, their eyes were open, and Jesus strictly charged them, saying, see that no one knows of this. Father, why is it, we've, we've mentioned this before, but remind us, why is it that Jesus doesn't want anyone to know? You would think that he comes out in all his glories, healing all over the place. Wouldn't Jesus have wanted everyone to know so that they could, they could follow him and, and, be, and the whole, convert the whole world? This is, a, this is a really important thing to notice. This is one of those, those issues, as you mentioned, that we kind of usually just gloss over because Jesus says this all the time. So, okay, so Jesus says this, so we just keep going. But this, every time we hear it, we just stop and say, well, what was he doing? Why was he doing that? And the, this is called typically in, you know, commentaries, the, the messianic secret. This Jesus is constantly hushing the crowd. Shh, don't tell. He, he heals somebody. Shh, don't tell. 
now they never listen, of course. They're not too different from, <laughs> from how we are today, right? What Jesus says, we don't listen. But he would tell them, don't say anything. And, and so this messianic secret, though, is not, sometimes people say, well, this is because Jesus, you know, just didn't want people to know who he was and whatever. When there's something bigger going on because there's a, a shocking moment in the gospel when he stops doing it. And that is when he leaves Jericho. When he's leaving Jericho and he heals there in Matthew's gospel, two blind men, just like here. And he doesn't tell them to be quiet. In fact, the crowds are, and the disciples are saying, Shh, guys, quiet down. He doesn't like it when you call him the Messiah and, and son of David. And, stuff. and Jesus says, come here. Do you want to be, what do you want from me? Uh, so he heals them. And then they get behind Jesus and follow him because he's heading to Jerusalem. So the messianic secret is out at that point. It, when he gets into Jerusalem and everyone's praising him and saying, save us, son of David. And the, the Pharisees there and the and religious stories there say, aren't you going to tell them to be quiet? Do you hear what they're saying? He says, if I did, even the rocks would proclaim it at this point. So there's a, a huge change from the moment he leaves Jericho to uh, from, from before all the way up to the moment he leaves Jericho. But what's happening there is he's now headed to Jerusalem, and we know what's going to happen when he gets there. And you so. Know what you're Sorry to jump in there, but what you're saying is really important because if you get this this kind of historical political background, again, that who, what, why, or when, if you understand a little bit the, of the situation behind the story, it, it makes so much more sense. And then it's not just chapter. I remember when I was just coming back to the church and I was reading the gospel of Mark and, and it was almost like, I was like, oh, okay, what's he going to do next? Okay, just one miracle after another. And it's almost, and, and but if you can see behind the scene and also see where Jesus is moving, why he's going where he's going, what he's doing. Then it's not just like a line of guys. That's how I was reading it. Jesus is standing there. And then this big line of people, paralytics, blind men, demoniacs, right? Get in the line, right? And it's just, it's like the cashier and Jesus, just boom, boom. He's just healing him, healing him. But no, there's a whole story going on behind. And then if you can do that, you can walk with him. And you can see why he's doing, when he's doing it, where he's doing it and so forth. Father, who are the, who, tell us who these Pharisees are. Why are they so much against him? Why is there so much tension between the Pharisees and Jesus? It's important that we know, again, that political background, the social background that's going on, who the different characters are, and why Jesus is engaging them where he's engaging them. So the Pharisees were one of the religious sects of the time. We, a lot of times we think of that there were the Jews in the first century, but the Jews were not too different from modern Christianity. There are so many different denominations, different factions arguing over major theological issues. And we know uh, in the first century in Jerusalem, in Judea, and also up in the Galilee, you have two major groups. It's almost like the modern American political model where you've got lots of different political parties, but there are two big ones that really run everything. It's the Republicans and the Democrats, right? And, uh, and there's the other the parties. And so among the Jews, there, were, there may have been hundreds of other little groups, but the big ones were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, uh, the Essenes, and things like that. The, the Pharisees were a movement, they were a movement among the Jews that probably goes back to about a century or so before Jesus, back into the Maccabean era, uh, maybe a little before, but anyway, somewhere in that period, and they are trying to solve the problem, the theological crisis that the Jews are in at this time. Here they are, about 500 years after the Babylonian exile, or at least the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. And all the prophets had said that someday they would return, they would rebuild the temple, the kingdom would be restored, God would appear in his glory cloud in the temple, the son of David would rule over the people, it would be like the kingdom of Solomon times ten. But here they are after the, they return from the Babylonian exile and the Medo-Persians are ruling over them. And they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, but it doesn't look all that great. And the glory cloud's not there. So it goes on like this, continuing, and there's this problem. Where are the fulfillments of the promise of God? The son of David's supposed to be ruling over us. Second Samuel 7, where is it? Where's the glory cloud? God promised he would be with us. Where, where are the promises of God being fulfilled? 
And so certain movements start to develop that have to try to answer this question. The Pharisees' answer was, because sin, the breaking of God's law, brought all this upon us, then the keeping of God's law will restore everything. And, and they were right in a certain sense. If they live in accordance with God's word, then the relationship will be healed. But the problem is they thought of God's word as simply the law of Moses and not what the, Moses, the law of Moses was, the type of, and that is the incarnation of the word of God among them. Jesus is the word of God. He is the, the, the law of God, not in stone test, but in the flesh. And so they're looking back to this type, this image, and they don't see, therefore, the fulfillment that is Jesus. And so Jesus and the Pharisees are often butting heads here because Jesus is doing things, saying things that are not exactly what the law of Moses said. He's doing things that are the fulfillment of the law of Moses. It, it's like they want Jesus to be doing things in perfect accord with what Moses said and did, and what, but Jesus isn't doing that. But to, to expect Jesus to do those things is to expect an adult, a man, a grown man, to act like he was when he was five years old, right? or to, to look like he did when he was five years old. But no, the incarnation of the law of God is the fulfillment of what was there in potency in the law of God through Moses. And so this is why they, they don't recognize a lot of times who Jesus is and what he's doing. You know, that, that gets us, really brings us to a broader issue in the gospel account that we're looking at. And that is like my idea, my thing about this line of, of, of healings going on. There's, there's all these healings. It gets us to a, a fundamental question of why is Jesus doing all these healings as the Messiah? Why is it the sign of his messiahship, if you will, of being the messiah, of being the king, includes him going around and doing this, you know, the blind, the paralytics, the demoniacs, and so forth. He's just constantly doing all this as really almost a core part of his ministry. Why is it that this is the sign of the coming of the kingdom, this idea that everyone's going to go around and be healed of all their ailments? If we're going to really understand the scriptures properly, we have to get inside and allow the expectation of the people at the time to be informing our vision, to see and expect as they saw and expected. And it helps us understand why Jesus is going around, as I said, almost like this, the people lining up. He's just doing healings after healings after healings. Why is it that Jesus is going and doing all these healings as, the, as this kind of almost this core revelation of his ministry? This is how he's going to show that he is the son of David, that he is the son of man, that he is the expected Messiah. And he is in, a, in just a couple of chapters, Matthew chapter 11, uh, John is arrested. And again, why it's so important that we understand these political tensions, right? John ends up being arrested because of what's going on politically, right? With Philip, who is the son of Herod the Great, um, who has control of a particular area in which Jesus is doing his ministry. And the tension then between Philip and Herod, who's all the, the son of Herod the Great in this area of Capernaum. John's disciples come to him and it says in chapter 11, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their, in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said, are you he who is to come? And then in verse four, it says, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and so on, as evidence that he is the Messiah. And I can only think that Jesus is referring back to Isaiah chapter 35. And we can just turn there very quickly. 35 verse, well, you could read from verse 1, but just take a look at there at verse 5 and following. 35, 5, the, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Whenever we hear then or in that day or whatever, think the coming of the Messiah, right? When the restoration after the Babylonian exile, exile happens, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a heart. So all this, in that day, there's going to be this idea of this restoration of, uh, or this, this fixing of the problems, if you will, right? Um, it's important to remember this, 
that Jesus is coming, yes, as the long-expected Messiah, the restoration of the Davidic kingdom, but more importantly, as you said earlier, he is also in the same moment the restoration of the presence of God, the kingship of God. And in this way, he goes about his ministry looking, I always think he's looking across his realm as a good king would do. And he sees all those parts of his realm that are not working right. And he goes, as a good king does, he puts his realm in order. He makes it function properly. Uh, he makes it thrive. So all the pieces of his kingdom are, uh, we can think economically, working properly together. But here, his kingdom is, is us. And, and he sees man under the dominion of the devil, having fallen in the fall of our first parents, the ancestral sin. And now the whole of this created order is kind of like broken apart. People that are supposed to walk can't walk anymore. They're supposed to see they can't see anymore. They're supposed to speak they can't speak anymore. Fundamentally, those who can't walk, those who, who formerly were made to walk with God can't walk with him anymore. And who can't see the Lord can't, or, or have become blind. And Jesus come to heal this aspect of his creation. And so we're put into this larger picture of this restoration of Eden, but that restoration, as we've been seeing week after week, is not only about the ministry of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, Jesus has come to do something fundamentally important for us to get in our minds. It is not about Jesus. He's come to restore us, and not just in our blindness and our lameness and, our, and, and, and so forth, but he's in, in restoring those things in us, He's come to restore us to be like him. And you, you've been speaking about this time of like the messianic secret. Last week, you talked about him calling his closest disciples to come in and see the, the, the healing taking place. Almost like that, that boot camp of discipleship. Huh? But that boot camp is for us. And now in this time after Pentecost, the church is given her marching orders, if you will, or is, is it called to remember our identity in the image and likeness of God, what our mission is now based upon the mission of Jesus Christ. Let's jump right into the Epistle Father in Romans chapter 15, and we're going to see this very clearly. Romans chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 in Romans. Now we, the strong, should bear the infirmities of the weak. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, is the, the church in her wisdom brings these beautiful things together because we have the gospel of this healing now, and now the church in, in her ministry of healing. Now we, the strong, should bear the infirmities of the weak instead of catering to ourselves. Let every one of you please his neighbor by doing good for his edification. For Christ did not seek his own pleasure, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. For whatever has been written has been written for our instruction, that through the patience and consolation afforded by the scriptures, we may have hope. May then the God of patience and comfort grant you to be of one mind towards one another, according to Jesus Christ, so that being one in spirit, you may with one mouth glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Wherefore, receive one another as Christ has received you in a manner that gives honor to God. Father, speak to us again. We've, we've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating the situation going on here in the epistle to the Romans. So what's going on in the early church in Rome, such that St. Paul is talking about the importance of this unity of being of one mind and so forth. So uh, we recall, as, we've, as we have talked about, I think before, about the, in the church in Rome, they were split. There were two groups there. The church was originally a Jewish Christian community. Very, very early in the apostolic period, a, a church begins to form there in the city of Rome as it began to form in other places, probably from returnees from Pentecost, from the baptism at Pentecost. But the, um, this church that forms out of the synagogue in Rome had a very strong Jewish influence because there was a large community of Jews in the city of Rome. But because the city of Rome is not Jewish but Gentile, Eventually, Gentiles start flooding into the church in Rome, and this creates a massive problem, as it did in a few other places in the early church. A tension between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians 
uh, want the Gentile Christian to be circumcised, keep kosher, so they'd be like them, because for them that meant to be a real Christian, you know. But the Gentiles would point out all sorts of problems with that kind of reasoning. And so there, there was a tension between the two groups, and Paul wrote his epistle to the Romans to try and bring that healing. He has explained to them in the first few chapters of the epistle that it is not your Gentile background or your Jewish background uh, to which you should be looking in your identity, but rather to Christ. And he shows them that it's through their baptism into Christ, chapter 6, that they are now a new creation, he says in chapter 7 and chapters 8. And now we are only in this life from then on, from that baptismal font, we are awaiting now the resurrection, the coming resurrection of our own bodies, which is the fulfillment of the resurrection of Christ. And so then he goes on in the, in the rest of the epistle to try to apply that to their situation. He says, look, you, therefore you are one. You are one in Christ. Live as one. Work as one. Be a model of Christ as one to the community around you. He's, he's given them that, at that, as you mentioned, that, that Pentecost exhortation. Here's the marching orders. And that and he really emphasizes that theme of unity there because there was this tension between the two groups. And you got to work together. You know, when you see the gospel text um, and, and, and understand the background that, you know, the, the blind, the paralytics, all these guys, these were the outcasts. These are the guys you did not come into contact with lest you become yourself unclean and an outcast. Um, but Jesus breaks through that barrier, understanding then what's going on in the community in Rome and then applying all of this to today, I think is super helpful because we oftentimes, I think, see when we see those who are weak in our community to be rejected, you know, someone is gossiping in the community. Someone is angry or frustrated in the community. And we point the finger at them and say, how dare them? How bad of them? How would, and instead of saying, here's, here's someone who's blind or someone who's paralytic, who's someone who's suffering. And it's to those pr people that Jesus goes intentionally and ministers to them for their healing. Um, and, uh, and so often we just get frustrated with people and we reject them and walk away instead of realizing that, Hey, here's the opportunity for my ministry in the body of Christ. St. Paul says, then we, the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. When we see those that are coming into our communities that are weak for whatever reason, maybe they're weak in their faith. Maybe they're weak in their love. Maybe they're unable to see the healing ministry of Christ in the church unable to see the forgiveness of sins. It's to those people that we should really focus our attention. I was reading some of the church fathers on this passage and came up, uh, St. John Chrysostom is always like, you know, off the charts, so good. And listen to what he says about binding yourselves to one another. And again, I, I say, let's put that idea of Jesus coming to this blind man at the forefront of our mind. He says, let us obey this command and bind ourselves closely to one another. For it is no longer just the weak that he is encouraging, but everyone. If someone wants to break relations with you, do not do the same with him. Rather, display even more love toward him, that you may draw him to you. For he is a member of the body. And when a member is cut off, we must do everything we can to unite it again and then pay more attention to it. To go to those that are suffering and weak. Go to those who in our community may be complaining. Go to those in our community who may, for one reason or the other, may be causing division or strife. And begin to heal them with love. This is so beautiful because we can see now Jesus' ministry as you're, as you're saying, the disciples and the church itself has gone through the boot camp as seen what Jesus has come to do. And then in these early years of the church, in the epistle to the Romans, the very same thing happens. There are blind men within the community. There are weak members of the community. St. Paul says, look, you want to be a, a, in Christ. It's to those very people that you're going to go. And then we can apply that text, having known that historical, literal background, then we can apply that text today and say, you know, if we want our communities to be one, to be filled with love, to be thriving, 
let's go out and minister to those weak members of the community, not pointing out their weakness, but giving them the very things that they need of hope, of restoration to communion, of love, which itself becomes this, this healing uh, ointment, if you will, of forgiveness, of patience to one another. And then the blind, the paralytics of our community will again walk with us, see with us, and be one with us, that we are restored to the vision which Jesus has come to give us. Today in our church, as we celebrate the gift of the resurrection on Sunday in the divine liturgy, the Lord rises and he meets us as he met the virgin. And then he becomes in our life the bestower of life, the restoration to a relationship with him and to those around us. To him be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Oh.